Jeannie is sharing. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Um, Gonna start. Um, yeah, so today's session, we are going to look at the hypothesis testing comparing two samples dependent um, samples of dependent groups. <clears throat> uh, by the end of the session, uh, we should be able to know how to conduct the hypothesis testing for two related population or two samples. Uh, this comes from the same population because they will be related and the, uh, the data that we're going to be using will be dependent or the variable that we're going to be using will be dependent on the, on the other. Therefore, it means when you, you look at the statement given, you need to be able to identify whether the case that they gave you or the statement that they gave you, the variable of interest that they want you to test, is it independent or is it dependent? If it's dependent, how would you identify that? Usually it's the before and the after situation that happens. So you will be able to see if they talk about um, before and after. Before you join the organization, after you have joined the organization, before you test the, uh, before you get tested, after you do something and then you re get retested, there you will have a case of before and after. <clears throat> and then we'll also do some activities. So just to recap, we know that uh, we can do two samples, but one can be independent. And we looked at the independent, that is if you have two groups, male and female, <laughs> primary and high school. Um, so as long as you've got two groups today, we're going to be looking at related samples where it is the same from the same population, but we're looking at the before, the group before, and the group after the treatment. So how do we do that? So for related sample, like I've said, um, we will have to calculate um, the mean, or we have to test if the two population are related. And we're going to be using the mean because most of the tests that you are doing in this module, you're always going to be testing for the mean. Then it means the sample that you have needs to be paired or needs to be matched. The measures are going to be repeated because you're going to do it before and then you're going to also test again after. And we going, because of the before and after from the same group of sample, then we need to do difference calculation to get one value or to get the difference of those paired values. <clears throat> the reason why we do the difference is also to eliminate any variations amongst the subjects. There are assumptions that also needs to be met, both population, both of the sample or the population has to be normally distributed or if they are not normally distributed, then the sample size has to be large. And when we talk about large, we're talking about a sample size of larger than eight. So in order for us to calculate the test statistic, which will help us in making the decision, there are a couple of things that we need to be aware of and we need to know how to calculate them. We first need to calculate the difference and after we have the difference, we need to calculate the average of those differences. So we calculate the mean of the differences and <clears throat> that will give us the point estimate of the differences yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, because we require the point uh, estimate minus the mean uh, value to 
calculate the test statistic. And then we also have to calculate the standard error, which is the sample standard deviation of the uh, hypothesis B. So the standard error or the sample standard deviation will be calculated by taking the square root of your difference of your observation, your not your observation, but your difference observation minus the mean squared. So it means you're gonna go and take for every observation a uh, difference. You're going to subtract that value from the mean, and then you're going to add all of them then divide them by, oh, take a square root of each value and divide by n minus y. And we're going to look at the example where n refers to the number of pairs <clears throat> that you have, which will be equivalent to your sample size. Okay, so to test, to calculate the test statistic, we use this formula. T, oh, wow. because we are assuming that the uh, standard deviation is not known for the population. So we're going to use the t-test. And to calculate the test statistic, we use the difference mean, sample difference mean minus the population difference, divide by your uh, standard error, which is your standard deviation divided by the square root of n. And remember, the standard deviation is calculated by the square root of your difference minus the difference mean squared divided by n minus 1. And <clears throat> once we have the test statistic, we can also go and find the critical value. And we know the critical value, we find it by using the t uh, value with your level of significance or alpha and the degrees of freedom of n minus 1. And where n is similar, it's your sample um, size. When making a decision at the end, after you have calculated your test statistic and you have your critical value, you then can make a decision. For paired samples, works exactly the same as with any other hypothesis because you will know in your hypothesis testing uh, <coughs> statement, you will always have the mean difference is greater than or it's less than or uh, greater than or equal or less than or equal or equal. So you need to be able to identify uh, whether you're doing a one-tail test, which is a directional test, especially in the less than for your alternative, or you doing an upper tail or a one tail test, a one directional where it is greater than. Or you doing a two tail test, which is a non directional test where you will have two regions of rejection. Now, the other thing that you also need to be mindful of is in the statement, there will be keywords that you need to always remember. For a less than, they can use words like decrease or less, or fewer, something like that. In the upper tail, they will use words like, uh, somebody's not muted, they will, they will use words like, uh, they will use words like increase, greater than, or it's bigger than, it's superior, things like that. That will give you a sign that this will be the greater that. For <clears throat> a two-tail or non-directional, they will use words like change, difference. And as long as they don't give you a direction of less or greater, then you know that that is a two-tail test. And the origin of rejection will be based on the sign that you have on your uh, your alternative hypothesis. And when you make your conclusion and your decision, you base that decision and the conclusion on the null hypothesis, not on the alternative, but on the null hypothesis. And you will either reject or not reject the null hypothesis. Okay, so let's look at an example. Assume you sent your sales people to a customer service training workshop. 
and you want to determine whether have the training made any difference in decreasing the number of complaints, and you went ahead and you collected the following data. <clears throat> you have your salesperson, you collected information about the number of complaints that each salesperson received before they attended the training. And then they went and they attended the training and then you took the you took the number of complaints after they have, con um, have attended the training. And you calculate the difference between before and after, uh, whether you use two minus one or one minus two, it's up to you. So I use two minus one. So before minus, oh, sorry, after minus before, and I get my difference for each salesperson. I need to also be able to calculate the other measures that I will require, uh, such as the mean. Remember, the mean is the difference, the sum of all the difference values divide by how many there are. So I'll take the sum of all these differences, which is minus 21, and divide by how many they are. I just count one, two, three, four, five. There are five. Divide by five, and that gives me minus 4.2. <laughs> so that will be 20, minus 21 divide by five. That gives me minus 4.22. And then I need to also calculate the standard deviation, <clears throat> which is the square root of the sum of your difference minus the mean squared divided by n minus 1. So it means for every line, I'm going to say minus 2 minus, minus 4.2, and then I'm going to square the answer. And I do for all of them and then add them all up. So I'll add, I'll get it out there. And then I will say 5 minus 1, which is 4. So I'll take the total that I got um, there. <clears throat> I'll take the asterisk total. So that total divide by 4. Take the square root of it. And the answer that I will get will be 5.67. You don't have to know how to calculate this because I don't think they will expect you to do any calculations. They will give you the values. So I'm just showing, I'm just demonstrating it, how we got to the 5.66. So we have the mean of minus 4.2, and then we have the standard deviation of 5.67. Now, <clears throat> we're going to first state the null hypothesis and the alternative. Always with the hypothesis, our mean will be always equals to zero, as we stated. So the population mean will always be will be zero. So the mean difference between population one and population two will be zero because they are from the same population. So if we take population one, population two, because they are from the same population, they are going to give us zero. Uh, so looking at the information that we had previously, let's go there. They wanted to know if there is some any of the decrease in the number of complaints. So already there we have our sign. So they want to check if there is a decrease or there are less complaints. So because of that, then it means in our alternative hypothesis, because we cannot put what the researcher wants to claim, we can only put it in the alternative. We cannot put it in the null hypothesis because in the null hypothesis, it always contains an equal sign. And a less than does not have an equal sign, so it goes in the alternative. So our alternatives will state that the mean difference is less than zero. And we know that we have training. <clears throat> and this is another additional information that they would have given you, which will give you the level of significance uh, of 0, 0,10. And we know that that will be our alpha, and we have calculated the mean difference. And when we go to the critical value, we go and find the critical value. So our T alpha of 0, 0,1 and the degrees of freedom of 4 is located at minus 1.57, uh, 533. 
So that is our critical value. We calculate our test statistic by substituting the value into the test statistic. Our difference, you remember the, the mean difference was minus, uh, the mean difference was minus 4.2, minus the uh, population difference, which is always stated in the state hypothesis statement, it's equals to zero, divide by your standard error, which is your standard deviation divided by the square root of n and your standard deviation, we calculated it previously, it was 5.67 divided by the square root of 5. And the answer that we get is minus 1.66. And from that, <coughs> we determine our region of rejection based on the critical value. So we know that our sign set is less than, so we know that it is in the negative side. So we will put a negative on the critical value of 1.53 and we highlight where our region of rejection will be. So anything that falls in the yellow or whatever the color is that, I'm seeing yellow, or anything that falls in the yellow area, we reject. Anything that falls in the white area, we do not reject. So let's see where our one minus 1.66 falls. It falls in the shaded area. Therefore, we reject the null hypothesis and, con and the decision will be to reject the null hypothesis and conclude that there is a significant difference in the number of complaints received. So the before and the after shows a difference. This is another example of how you can do a hypothesis testing for two uh, t-test paired two sample of means on Excel. So if you remember our data that we have, we had the five sales uh, sales uh, persons, they are before and they are after. We took those data and we put it into Excel and in the Excel there is a data analysis um, tab, but you need to activate it by using an Excel add-in if you don't have that. <clears throat> and we use that to calculate the test statistic and the output that you get is this. And on that output, it gives you the mean of, it gives you your, <coughs> sorry, it gives you the, um, the measures for both the pre and the post. So this will give you the measure of central tendency or location, the mean, and it gives you the measure of uh, variation, the variance, and it also gives you the observation for each. So you can see that the observation is five. Then it also goes and, and say what the hypothesis mean was. So this will be your, your null hypothesis statement and your degrees of freedom, uh, remember, it is n minus 1, and we did find that n minus 1, which is 5 minus 1, is equals to 4. You can see that on Excel output, it also gives you that. Then it goes and calculate the test statistic. As you can see, there is the test statistic. Now, the thing that you need to be aware of is your test statistic will come back positive on Excel, but you need to be mindful of the fact that Um, depending on your critical value as well, you need to make sure that your uh, test statistic, it also takes the sign of the, um, sorry, of the hypothesis, not the null hypothesis, the sign that is allocated to the null hypothesis as well. Because if you look at this and you're going to use the, uh, test statistic as it is, and you're going to assume that it's positive, you are going to not reject the null hypothesis. Okay, so uh, when looking at the critical value for one tail test, then we get the critical value for a one tail test, and we get the critical value for a two tail test. So since we were doing a one tail test, as you can see, there is our critical value. And remember also, the sign set less than, so we're going to put a negative in front as well. 
So now the other thing that you can also get, which I haven't touched now, is the p-value. That is very important because most of the time in your exam or assignment, they will ask you about the p-value. So you also need to be mindful of that, that for a one-sided tape, the p-value is 0 0.0866, but for a two-tail, <coughs> a, um, a p-value will be double. So if I take if I take this value and I multiply that value by two, I will get the two-tail p-value because of the two regions of rejection, it shares them. If I'm given a two-tail value and I want to go to a one tail, oh, um, my, my arrow went way too ahead. And I want to go there, I need to divide by two because I need to split that those two areas into, into two so that I can get the value for one. <clears throat> so that is the thing that you need to be aware of and always be mindful of. That if you are given the p-value for one and they are asking you to calculate the p-value for two tail, you need to multiply by two. If they've given you a two tail and they ask you to calculate one or give one p-value or a p-value for one tail test, then you need to, <clears throat> you will need to remember to divide by two. Okay, so, and that concludes me talking and now it's your turn to answer some of the questions. Are there any questions? Anything that you are missing from my explanation? Was it clear? Was it difficult? Or we can just dive in, dive in into the activities. Okay. So let's look at the activities. Question number one. A matched pair t-test should be used when you are Number one, testing a two-tailed hypothesis, comparing means on a measurement from before and after a specific event, comparing two variables which come from the same group, comparing two means on a variable where data were drawn from the same population. <coughs> which one? One, two, three, or four. You can also write on the the chat if you do not want to speak out. Uh, check the chat for any responses. Is it option one, two, or three, or four? Think about what we just discussed today. What have I said a lot about? dependent groups. No one, okay. The answer would be option. Yeah, option my base two. list would be two because it's yes. before and after. Yes, it's option two. Number B. Two samples may be regarded as independent when. So this is what we discussed last time. I just want to see if you are able to differentiate what we learned today and what we learned last time. Dependent variable means there is a, some relation between the two. Independent means there is no relation between the two. There is nothing affects the other. The other one doesn't affect the other. When dressed with the other one, the other thing affects the, other, the behavior of the other. Something like yeah. that. So would it be option one? That will be option one. Okay. Also, when you look at this, Think about everything that we discussed today, right? But let's see. You need to be able to identify the key words in the question as well. A sample of 70 people are tested on 
a test for assertiveness before and after a workshop in which they are given assertiveness training. Which of the following is most appropriate formula for comparing the mean assertiveness score before the training with the one after the training? Think about the formula we used today. Okay, is it one, two, or three? This one, I can just also add the zero. Maybe probably it's that's the thing that is confuse, confusing you. Zero or mean D? Because they didn't, because it's equals to zero anyway. So the formula we use today would look somehow like this. Like this. Minus. I'm going to put there minus. Mindy, and that's supposed to be a subscript, not a big thing. Mindy. So is it one, two, or three? Let's identify what is it that we need to look at the before and after. So, for yeah, so it will be a dependent variable, so three. It will be option three. So let's recap on this one. So this is for when you have one sample. It's hypothesis for one sample. We did this, I think, in April already for one sample. And this we did it, I can't even remember when we did this one. But this is for independent samples, two groups. And this is for dependent. Two groups as well, right? So you need to be able to differentiate which one is which. Uh, and then remember with two groups, it will be male and female, something like that. Uh, for one group, it will just be one population and they will give you the mean of that and the standard deviation and then just calculate. Okay. Let's look at number three. I think this will be the second last. There will not be, oh, there is another. Yeah, it's the second list. To test the effic efficacy of a workshop aimed at improving people's interpersonal skills, <clears throat> a researcher applies a scale which rates the interpersonal skill of 20 participants before and after the participant in the workshop. Scores on his rating scale before the general population have a mean of 5 and a standard deviation of 1.5. Which one of the following is the most appropriate way to express the null hypothesis for this analysis? What's very important is the before and after. <laughs> is it For sure, I can tell you, we do not represent uh, any hypothesis test testing using the point estimate because the point estimate D is for the sample. So therefore, this one will not be correct. And because we're dealing with two groups, we cannot represent it like this. This is for one group. So that is not the man. So we are left with two statements. Null hypothesis one says the mean is equals to the population mean of the other. 
number four, it says the mean is not equal to the population of the other. Now, think about it. In a high, in a null hypothesis, there is always an equal sign. So, so it will be equal, less than or equal, or greater than or equal. Will number four be so one of the options? Yes, that will be option. Option two is the correct answer because this one, it, null hypothesis, can never have, can never have a not equal. A null hypothesis can never have a not equal. The only signs that you can get in a null hypothesis is equal, less than or equal, or greater than or equal. So when you see signs like less than, not equal or greater than in a null hypothesis, you must know that that is not the correct way. Okay. Let's go to question four, which is our last question, and then we're going to call it a day. A researcher wants to test the following hypothesis. The null hypothesis states that the mean is equal to the population mean one is equal to the population mean two. And the alternative states that the mean population one is not equal to the mean population two. Uh, if I can ask before I read the entire statement, by looking at this sign, is this a directional or a non-directional? It would be non-directional. It is a non-directional test. Good. Okay, on the basis of the data provided, the output from a computer program indicates that a T value of T is equal to 1.72 was found. So, like I said previously, they will not expect you to calculate the value of T. They will most likely give it to you. They will not expect you to go and find the p-value. They will most likely give it to you. So, <clears throat> on the basis of the data provided, the output from a computer program indicates that a t-value of t is equal to 1.72 was found, with the p-value for a two-tail test was given as 0 0.056 a two-tail test. So that is very important to also remember because we're doing a non-directional two-tail test there because of that equal, not equal sign. And we have our p-value. What should the researcher do to evaluate the results at a level of significance of alpha of 0, 0.05? Number one, this are, these are the thing that this is, most likely they're checking if you understand how to use the p-value. So let's see. What should the researcher do to evaluate the results at the level of significance of 0, 0,05? Number one, it says divide the p-value by two before comparing it with the p-value. Number two, multiply the p-value by two before comparing it with the level of significance alpha. Number three says divide alpha by two before comparing P to Z, uh, level of significance. And number four says compare the p-value as given. Now, what you need to understand with that question is, are you able to, from the information given, are you able to make a decision? Definitely, yes, you are able to make a decision without doing any calculation, without doing anything, by just comparing the value of P value and that. There is, uh, and now I'm giving you the answer. The reason why I'm saying that is because the statement says, what should the researcher do to evaluate the results at the level of significance, it means what does the researcher have to do to make a decision? 
and how do we make a decision? Because we know that this, um, our hypothesis testing, our alternative says it's a two-tailed non-directional test. Therefore, it means the p-value, if it's given to us uh, and the p-value is a two-tailed p-value, then there's nothing we need to do. We just need to compare the p-value and the level of significance and make a decision. Why? Because the rule for decision using p-value says if the p-value is less than or equals to alpha, we reject. If the p-value is less than alpha, not less than or equals to, we reject the null hypothesis. That is the decision. That is what the decision rule says. Now, they have given you a two-tailed test. They told us that the null hypothesis and the alternative hypothesis is a non-directional two-tailed test. Our two-tailed test, they gave us the p-value. So what we can do with that is take the p-value, given the p-value as given, and compare it with that. So we're going to take our p-value of 0, 0,056 and compare it to our level of significance of 0, 0,05 and determine if it's greater than. So we know we can see that this p value is greater than or equals to, or it's greater than uh, the, le the level of significance. So therefore, we do not reject, but that's not what they're asking you. They're asking you the step that I just said. We're just comparing the two values. So it means option number four is the correct answer. Now, here's the catch. If, if they would have given you and they would have said, if they would have said, um, the p-value, I'm gonna change all this statement. Now, let's remove only one piece of it. If they would have said with the p-value of one tail test, given that the p-value, and I'm going to change and swap these values, and they give you the value of zero, comma, zero two eight. Let's assume that that is the statement that they have given you. When you think about it, you go back to your alternative statement and say, but my alternative statement says not equal, therefore it is a non-directional, which means it's a two-tail test. Given that it's a two-tail test, then what the researcher needs to do to make a decision you will have to make a decision by looking at the p-value. So because this is a two-tailed test, therefore your p-value will be equals to, remember I said, to get a two-tailed test p-value, you're going to multiply the value of a one-tailed test to get the value of your p-value and then you come and evaluate. Now, which which option would that be? It would have been option number two. Because option number two says you multiply your p value by two before comparing it to the level of alpha. So we're going to do this step and then we come back to the step. So if you are given a one tail test, you're going to multiply that by two to get a two-tail test p-value and then evaluate or compare the two value, the p-value and the level of significance. That is one scenario. What if the other scenario was like this? I'm going to give you another scenario. I'm going to put everything back, everything back. But the scenario here changes. Two, instead of using that sign, let's assume 
that they said it is less than they. So if your alternative is less than, therefore it is a directional test and it is a one tail test. And they have given you all this information and they tell you that a two tail test, they are, uh, its p value is equals to 0 0.56. And the question is, what should the researcher do to evaluate the results? at a level of significance of five. So the researcher needs to make a decision. Does he have all the information required to make a decision? Definitely, yes. But is it sufficient to make a decision? No, because it's a two-tailed test p-value. In order for the researcher to compare the p-value to the level of significance, they need to find the p-value. Finding the p-value because it's a two tail, they're going to take 0, 0.056 divided by two. And this I explained uh, with the example there uh, on an Excel thing. So that will be 0, 0.028. But this is just explaining that you will get the answer there for the one tail test because you want to make a decision for a one tail test and then come to that step and compare and make a decision. But the appropriate answer would have been option number one. So you just need to be very careful when you read the questions as well. Evaluate what you are given. Make sure that you understand the question. Look at the option and make sense of what is required to answer that question. Because you can see that with different scenarios, you could have gotten either option one, two, or three as an answer. It's all in the detail. So with our question coming back, was a two tail, two directional. The only thing that is required, the statement in the null hypothesis compares to the two tail there. Then we just take the p-value as is because it's a two-tail already calculated given p-value and the level of significance and make a conclusion. Compare the two and make a conclusion. That means option four. Are there any questions other than uh, if there are no questions? So we can end the session early today. I uh, will just end right there. In the absence of questions, just to introduce again to if some of you are new and you don't know, I do this from Pambili Analytics and our aim and mission is to close the gap in terms of literacies when we're looking at data, numeracy, statistics, research, especially uh, the analytical skills. And we offer a range of services that you can also benefit from, uh, more especially in terms of our interaction lessons or sessions. We offer instructor-led online training, similar to how we're doing it right now. At the moment, we're running a special which I think it will be this month will be the end of this month. And in June, we revert back to our normal rate for specials, uh, which is the normal rate is 350 per hour. Um, and if you want access to the recording, the note, uh, you have to sign in as a member and join the channel as a member. When you join the channel, uh, very important, before you sign up, look very carefully on the membership that you are joining on. Only the membership that gives you real packs are from loyalist up until promoter. Otherwise, you can subscribe to the channel, share the channel, like our video, comment on our video so that we can improve the content as we go along. 
other than that, thank you for coming. And if you need to get hold of us, those are our contact details. Enjoy the rest of the evening. I will see you on, sat on Saturday. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks a lot. Hey. Yeah.